on crime, terrorism, homeland security, and investigations will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. We welcome everyone to today's hearing. Uh, this is the hearing that will not be disappointing to all of the country. Uh, this is the hearing that has not been overhyped, and we actually do expect to get some substance out today, Ms. Jansen, so we're actually looking forward to this. Um, this is uh, entitled Oversight of the Department of Justice Grant Programs, and I recognize myself for an opening statement. Uh, thank you to all of those in attendance today's hearing, as well as our distinguished witness, Mr. Alan Hansen, who's testifying on, on behalf of the Department of Justice. This morning's hearing is the fourth in a series of hearings held by this committee examining Department of Justice components, programs, and activities. The ultimate goal of these hearings is to reform and reauthorize, in some cases authorize for the very first time, important components of the Department of Justice. Grants administered by the DOJ help communities across the United States fight crime, address domestic violence and sexual assault, and provide their officers with the tools and skills they need to do their job. Approximately $2 billion is appropriated by Congress each year to fund DOJ grant programs targeting state and local law enforcement activities. As with any government service, Congress must periodically review these grants to ensure they are working as intended and use taxpayer dollars wisely and efficiently. Today, this subcommittee will examine DOJ grant programs administered by the Office of Justice Programs, the Office of Violence Against Women, and the Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services. Office of Justice Programs, or OJP, administers grants that provide leadership support to federal, state, local, and tribal justice systems by sharing the latest knowledge and practices with these agencies and communities. Grants administered um, address areas of need in research, statistics, law enforcement assistance at the state and local level, and support for juvenile justice programs. The Office for Victims of Crime, which is tasked with administering the Crimes Victims Fund, is also a part of OJP. The Office of Violence Against Women administers programs authorized by the Violence Against Women Act. Approximately 25 grant programs are authorized by that legislation with the goal of strengthening services to victims of domestic violence and sexual assault while holding offenders accountable. The Office of Community-Oriented Policy so Policing Services, or COPS Office, provides information and grant resources to state, local, territorial, and tribal law enforcement agencies throughout the nation. Some of the work supported by the COPS Office grants include developing innovative crime fighting and policing strategies, providing training and technical assistance to both law enforcement and community members and assisting in the hiring of community policing professionals. During my time as judge, I've worked with thousands of police officials with a variety of background and experience. The overwhelming majority of them embrace the idea of building good relationships in high crime communities to address the underlying conditions that contribute to the crimes. Two programs worthy of note include Anti-Heroin Task Force, the AHTF, program and the COPS anti-gang initiative. Uh, the nation is facing an epidemic amount of opioid and drug abuse, including heroin, the way it's come back, that has been indiscriminate in its effect and devastation. Americans from all walks of life and social status have been directly affected by the epidemic, whether they personally became addicted or had friends or family members who have lost their lives. The Anti-Heroin Task Force has worked to advance public safety by getting these toxic drugs off our streets and out of our communities. Anti-Gang Initiative works hand-in-hand -hand with these efforts by prosecuting the gangs that peddle these drugs. While many of these grant programs help create a positive impact in our communities on a daily basis, not all of the DOJ spending is as efficient as it should be. Recent GOA investigations have targeted the mismanagement of federal resources 
and identified multiple programs that include duplication and overlap of these DOJ grant programs. For example, in 2012, GAO reviewed all 253 grant award announcements that OJP, OVW, and the COPS Office published on their websites for fiscal year 2010 and identified instances of overlap across the components. When GAO participated in the Judiciary Committee's DOJ oversight hearing March 21st of this year, Director Maher testified that DOJ had implemented most of GOA's recommendations to improve grant administration and management. However, a cursory review of the long list of programs currently being administered by DOJ suggests that more streamlining is likely warranted. DOJ budget requests $6 million increase to uh, support the Grants Management System 2.0 initiative. So we are interested in hearing about potential improvements of efficiency, transparency of DOJ's grant-making sections. President Trump has made clear that reducing crime, violent crime in our communities is a top priority for his administration. Attorney General Sessions has already taken important steps toward reaching that goal. It's contended DOJ grant programs are an important tool in fighting crime. If so, it's vital they work as efficiently as possible. And with that in mind, I'm looking forward to hearing the testimony today. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the Crime Subcommittee, Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas, for her opening statement. Let me thank the chairman, and good morning as well. Let me thank the witness, uh, Mr. Hansen, for your service to the nation. Uh, and also, uh, let me um, uh, pleasantly recognize the ranking member uh, of the full committee, recognize the chairman of the full committee, uh, and um, appreciate that the ranking member will um, be in place um, for me, and I thank him for his extended courtesies because I have a conflicting uh, hearing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that um, we have many opportunities to work together on this uh, committee, and we have done so over the years, and I'm delighted that you've mentioned certainly some of the issues that we all have concern with, and I think we do have concern with the efficient operation of the Department of Justice that I've always called uh, the uh, anchor and the source of assistance for the vulnerable, but also for upholding the law of the land and protecting uh, the American citizens. But then when they need justice and they need fairness uh, and relief from those who would uh, undermine them. The Justice Department is there for them in a myriad of ways. Uh, each of us on this panel, regardless of party, are committed to eliminating uh, wasteful spending and unnecessary duplication in funding issued pursuant to federal grant programs. Uh, however, as I indicated, uh, there are many programs that may be, uh, may have the perception of such, but are vital to many constituents across the nation. Given that the department administers grants that award recipients over $5 billion per year without exception, accountability is paramount to ensure the grants are not being used for fraudulent purposes. That is why we have, audited, we have auditing requirements and reviews by the Office of Inspector General and as Acting Assistant Attorney General of the OJP, it's Mr. Hansen's responsibility to oversee compliance with these goals. I assume you work hard every day. As we consider today the findings of the DOJ's OIG with respect to various Justice Department grant programs, there are several factors we should keep in mind. First, although I'm disappointed to learn that OJP's tribal justice system infrastructure failed to meet various auditing standards due to deficiencies between OJP and BJA resulting in significant ways, I'm heartened that it has undertaken proposed remedial actions to address these findings. That program is well needed and is often heard by our Native American friends of the status that they hold and the belief that they do not hold the same respect and dignity of all other Americans. Specifically, OJP has agreed with all of OIG's 12 recommendations made in its auditing. By identifying these deficiencies and detecting fraud, we hope that we'll be moving forward. Second, the recent semi-annual report to Congress indicates OIG audited additional programs such as DC's Office of Victims and Services and Justice Grants and Iowa Tribe of Oklahoma, which support investigation and prosecution of child sexual abuse. Uh, OIG did not identify any significant concerns, and um, we hope these programs are on schedule. Several other programs fell into these criteria, and therefore we hope that um, 
many of these grant programs that are vital to the success of our criminal justice system do in fact work, are effective, and I'd like to make sure that they are in place. Um, let's take, for example, Houston. I'm pleased that my constituents and those of ranking member uh, Conyers were the first to be awarded the National Institute of Justice Research Grants to address untested sexual assault kits, SAC, also known as rape kits. Houston, Texas received 176,000 in fiscal year 2010, which remained in place for a number of years. These are vital grants to be able to stop uh, the terrible results of untested rape kits and leaving many women in, uh, across America without justice. Those rape kits recognize and represent uh, critical justice. Therefore, it's critical that we examine cautiously the beneficial impact these grant programs have on the lives of, American, uh, of the American people and the uh, adverse effect that it will trigger if we arbitrarily cut much needed programs due to deficiencies. Um, although OIG did not find evidence of endemic fraud or rampant noncompliance across the spectrum, a 29% cut is proposed in the President's new budget for the Office of Justice Programs. And the vast majority of the recipients of grants administered through the Office of Justice Program, uh, such as the Bureau of Justice, Office of Juvenile Justice, Delinquency, just to name a few, and of course the essential grants administered through the Office of Violence Against Women, these are needed. Mr. Hansen was also, indicate, also indicating your testimony, and we agree that the nation's overall rate of violent crime remains historically low. However, the FY 2018 budget release shows a substantial increase for prosecution and support for robust law enforcement. Finally, I must remind my colleagues that efforts to ensure that grant recipients are accountable stewards of taxpayer subsidies should not be used to eliminate these uh, crucial programs. Uh, I believe that we're helping so many different people across the nation uh, and um, I want us to continue to be in this august room where justice is rendered. Let me also just conclude my remarks as I've done. Um, this has been a tumultuous couple of months. This is the Justice Committee, and I would hope that as we proceed with a number of hearings and investigations that are proceeding in the United States Senate and the House, that we will find it upon ourselves that there will be a courageous effort uh, to begin to assess what kind of inquiry we should be making on any number of questions from public trust to abuse of power to uh, the um, uh, issues uh, that have uh, uh, gathered around the question of obstruction of justice. I think that we are courageous, Republicans and Democrats, to do the right thing for the American people, and I hope that we will do the right thing for the American people. It is time that we begin an inquiry on all of these issues that are involving the executive and the administration. With that, I yield back. At uh, this time, the chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, uh, Mr. Goodlap of Virginia, for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This hearing is the fourth hearing in the Judiciary Committee's series of hearings to review Department of Justice components, programs, and activities and identify matters at the Department of Justice that are in need of reform and reauthorization. It is my hope that this hearing also underscores the importance of having distinct and detailed authority in place for each DOJ grant program funded by Congress. Congress appropriates roughly $2 billion annually to the Department of Justice for its grant programs. In addition, in recent years, DOJ has administered an additional two to three billion dollars annually in grant funding through the Crime Victims Fund. The valuable Crime Victims Fund resources are available to provide victim compensation assistance and other services that improve communities' responsiveness to the needs of victims. Many of DOJ's grant programs support critical efforts to prevent, investigate, and prosecute crime. For example, Funding Congress provides for economic, high technology, and white collar crime prevention grants has helped the National White Collar Crime Center in Richmond, Virginia, deliver training in computer forensics, cyber, and financial crime investigations, and intelligence analysis to law enforcement agencies in all 50 states. Such efforts provide critical national leadership and strengthen the nation's law enforcement networks as a whole. Another success story is the funding Congress has provided for regional information sharing activities, 
like the RISS program. RISS offers secure information sharing and communications capabilities, analytical and investigative support services, and event deconfliction services to enhance officer safety. It supports efforts to defeat organized and violent crime, drug activity, violent extremism, human trafficking, and other national scourges across jurisdictions and regions. While there are many federal programs with laudable goals, the truth is that the federal government simply cannot sustain its current path of deficit spending. As such, Congress must take tough decisions among priorities at all agencies. Such, uh, just seven years ago, Congress appropriated 50% more funding for DOJ grants than it did in the FY 2017 Omnibus Appropriations Bill enacted in early May of this year. In order to make the necessary priorities, we must have a full picture of all the grant spending. Complicating the picture for DOJ grants is a lack of specific authorization for much of the grant funding. Of the approximately 90 distinct appropriations for grant programs in fiscal year 2017, roughly 70% are not currently authorized by the Judiciary Committee. Of those, approximately 42% have never been authorized by the Judiciary Committee. It is imperative that Congress be apprised of the fundamental parameters of these programs. We need to learn who is eligible, what the grant awards look like, what percentage of appropriated funding is actually distributed to grantees, and what DOJ permits the funds to be spent on. Last but not least, we need to understand the purpose of these unauthorized programs, determine whether they are achieving the established goals, and assess whether the department's goals align with the Judiciary Committee's priorities. Once the committee evaluates these programs, I intend to oversee the advancement of congressional authority for the most worthy programs. This hearing may also review the use of the Crime Victims Fund. The Crime Victims Fund was established in 1984 by the Victims of Crime Act, also known as VOCA, to provide funding for state victim compensation and assistance programs. The Crime Victims Fund does not receive appropriated funding. Rather, deposits to the Crime Victims Fund come from a number of sources, including criminal fines, forfeited bail bonds, penalties, and special assessments. For fiscal year 2018, $610 million, more than 30% of the nearly $2 billion allotted under DOJ's budget submission for discretionary grants, is proposed to be supported by a transfer of mandatory budget authority from the Crime Victims Fund. I look forward to hearing DOJ's justification for this request, which is the continuation of an effort that began under the past administration. In the course of the Judiciary Committee's comprehensive review of DOJ programs and components, it will be appropriate to consider whether the Crime Victims Fund's annual allocation formula should be updated. In the meantime, I will expect DOJ to consult with this committee rather than merely with the Appropriations Committees on when and if it is ever appropriate to subvert the Crime Victims Fund allocation formula in order to make up for discretionary appropriations shortfalls. I, think, uh, I thank uh, all of you for joining us today. I especially thank Mr. Hansen, and I look forward to your testimony. Thanks, Chairman. At this time, without um, the Chair recognizes the Judiciary Committee Ranking Member, and um, recognize you to give an opening statement. Thank you, J Judge, Chairman, and uh, to our Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Goodlatte. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to uh, come here today to listen to the Acting Assistant Attorney General, Mr. Alan Hansen, of the Office for Justice Program. We welcome you to this discussion today. And uh, we want to examine the grant programs administered by the Department of Justice. Certainly, it's appropriate that we conduct regular oversight of the various programs their administration and their implementation, both because of the amount of funding involved and because of the important role they play in helping to make us all safer from crime. Uh, it's, uh, 
In total, the department administers grants that award more than $5 billion per year. These grants are critical to the ability of recipients, including state, local, and tribal governments, to engage in the full range of activities necessary to prevent crime and to investigate crimes that do take place and to hold offenders accountable and to reduce recidivism and most importantly, prepare ex-offenders for re-entry into their communities after they've served their sentences. Grant funding also helps provide some measure of assistance to crime victims who need and deserve help after being harmed. Uh, I'll mention just a few of these pro programs to illustrate the range of their impact. Grant funding under the Violence Against Women Act, established in 1994, has been critical to improving our nation's response to intimate partner violence, sexual assault, and stalking. Then there's the COPS hiring program, also established in 1994, which has helped over 13,000 state, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies hire over 129 police officers and deputy sheriffs. In my district in Michigan, the department's grants include funding from the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative, and they've helped Detroit address its backlog of untested sexual assault kits and match samples with offenders whose DNA is contained in the FBI's database. The Second Chance Act, a bipartisan program enacted more than a decade ago, has helped state and local governments focus resources on programs that have been proven to reduce recidivism and make us safer by helping ex-offenders successfully reintegrate into society after incarceration, most important. In fact, just today, the Justice Center of the Council of State Governments is issuing a report entitled Reducing recidivism, states deliver results. And I ask that uh, unanimous consent that this report uh, be entered into the hearing record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. The, the report highlights the results in seven states in which recidivism has decreased according to several different measures. These states include my state of Michigan, have all received significant Second Chance Act funding. Clearly this program works and we must continue to support it. And just last year, this committee worked in a bipartisan manner to enact the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act programs that will target funding to help prevent and address our hair on an opioid drug crisis. Uh, Mr. Chairman and my colleagues that are here, our state, local, and tribal governments need our help, and our work to give it to them has been successful. For more than 25 years, the tide of crime and violence has receded. While yearly statistics can vary, and some cities may not always experience the same success as the national trend during a given period of time. Overall, crime is about half of what it was at its peak in 1991. Violent crime has plummeted by 51%. And property crime has fallen by 43% and homicides are down 54%. Providing an array of grants, some that are more general in scope and others that are more focused on particular techniques or problems, 
has been a critical, has been critical to a multifaceted, successful strategy to fight crime. And so that's why we conduct oversight here today. Going forward, we have the opportunity to both maintain and improve our grant programs. And I look forward to the continued success. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back if there's any time remaining. Thank the ranking member. At this time, uh, we'll begin by swearing in our first our witness. So if you would, Ms. Hanson, please rise. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, self you God. You may be seated. Let the record reflect the witness responded in the affirmative. Um, our witness, Mr. Alan Hansen, who currently serves as Acting Assistant Attorney General for the Department of Justice's Office of Justice Programs. Uh, prior to the Department of Justice, Mr. Hansen worked in a variety of roles on Capitol Hill. Most recently, Mr. Hansen worked for Senator Richard Shelby, where he served as general counsel and chief of staff. Mr. Hansen also gained congressional policy and political experience in his previous roles as a legislative director for only Senator Shelby, but Senator Jeff Sessions, name that rings a bell, um, and Congresswoman Ann Northrop. Mr. Hansen received a bachelor degree from Vanderbilt University, part of the Southeastern Conference, and earned his JD degree from Georgetown University. Um, the witness's statement will be entered into the record in its entirety. Uh, we just ask that the witness uh, summarize his testimony in five minutes or less. To help you stay within that time, there's a light in front of you, and uh, with one minute to go, it moves to yellow, and to alert you, there's a minute left, and when the light turns red, that's the indication that time has expired. Uh, I now recognize our first and only witness, Mr. Hansen. I'm going to have to step out for a moment, and Mr. Johnson's going to temporarily chair, but uh, I've reviewed your written statement and I look forward to hearing from you further. Mr. Hanson, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Congressman Gohmert. Uh, thank you to Ranking Member Jackson Lee. Uh, thank you to Chairman Goodlatte and to Ranking Member Conyers and other members of the subcommittee for having me here to testify this morning. Uh, it's a privilege to be here to discuss the work of my office, the Office of Justice Programs, as well as the work of the Office of Community Oriented Policing Services and the Office on Violence Against Women. Let me say, first of all, I'm very pleased to see some of my former colleagues here today. Before taking my current position as head of OJP, I spent more than 17 years working for members of Congress in both the House and the Senate. I fully appreciate the magnitude of your responsibility, and I share your commitment to ensuring that federally funded programs are well managed and responsive to local needs. Under the leadership of Attorney General Sessions, the Department of Justice is working diligently to fulfill its original core mission, which is to uphold the rule of law and ensure that justice is administered fairly and effectively. As you are aware, OJP, OVW, and the COPS Office award a wide range of grants and cooperative agreements to support local, state, and tribal law enforcement, criminal and juvenile justice agencies, and victim service programs. These funds have proven to be critical to ensuring public safety in America. But we do much more. We provide training and technical assistance, we fund research, we develop technology, we gather statistics, and we distribute information to help justice system professionals do their jobs better. Using all the resources, Congress has given us, we are working hard to reduce crime and violence and protect our communities. Empowered by an executive order from President Trump, the Attorney General established a task force on crime reduction and public safety to address the law and order challenges facing our country. Each of the department's grant-making offices is playing a key role. Later this month, under the auspices of this task force, we'll host a National Crime Reduction Summit. We'll be bringing in law enforcement experts, victim assistance organizations, community groups, and researchers to share information about local crime fighting efforts and to map out strategies for reducing crime. The President's budget request for fiscal year 2018 offers another clear signal of this administration's commitment to public safety. His request includes $70 million for a block grants program for Project Safe Neighborhoods, which will create federal, state, local, and tribal partnerships to reduce gang and gun crime. Another $5 million would go to a DOJ-wide program targeted at cities with high rates of violence. We're also working to fight the threat posed by illicit drugs, especially opioids. 
We know the dangers they pose, both to our citizens and to our law enforcement professionals. That's why the President's budget asked for $20 million for a new comprehensive opioid abuse, abuse program and another $80 million to support drug courts and other substance abuse programs. Of course, the safety of our communities is utterly dependent on the skill, commitment, and not least, well-being of our law enforcement officers. These officers put their lives on the line every day. They deserve to know we have their back. The President has made his commitment to America's public safety officers very clear. One of his earliest actions was to sign an executive order directing the Justice Department to develop a strategy to reduce violence against law enforcement. His budget request proposes substantial investments in our Bulletproof Vest Partnership Program and in resilience training available through our Valor Initiative. We're also demonstrating a solid commitment to officer wellness research and the Body Armor Standards and Testing Program managed by our National Institute of Justice. The COPS Office is, of course, central to the Department's officer safety and violent crime reduction efforts. COPS programs have supported more than 13,000 of the nation's 18,000 law enforcement agencies. Up to $137 million under the COPS hiring program will be available this year to help jurisdictions fight violent crime and address other high-priority local concerns. And $157 million is proposed in the President's FY 2018 budget for law enforcement hiring. Finally, as we deal with the scourge of gun, gang, and drug violence, we're also fighting to reduce domestic violence, sexual assault, dating violence, and stalking. Our Office on Violence Against Women, Women funds hundreds of law enforcement officers and prosecutors who enforce protection orders, try sexual assault cases, and bring perpetrators of these crimes to justice. And OVW's grant-funded program serves some 650,000 victims every year. We propose to build on this record of success. The President's budget request for OVW includes $480 million to reduce crime, help victims, reach all affected communities, and promote evidence-based practices. Between the Department's three grant-making offices, we are helping to lead an aggressive, preemptive attack on the crime and violence creeping into too many of our neighborhoods while guarding against waste, fraud, and abuse of taxpayer dollars. I have given a brief, but I hope compelling account of the Justice Department's work to fight crime, serve victims, and protect our nation's law enforcement officers. With your support, we will fight hard to secure an America where criminals find no haven and law-abiding citizens do not have to look over their shoulders. This is my pledge to you. Thank you for inviting me to testify before the subcommittee today. I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Hansen, for your testimony. <clears throat> we'll now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions, and I'll begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Um, I'm really grateful for the information you provided us today. Your written statement was very helpful. The summary today is helpful as well. And um, I was particularly grateful for uh, you bringing up uh, efforts that are being taken to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse uh, through the department's grant-making uh, programs. We've, there's a lot of attention being paid to that these days, and I think it's appropriate and necessary. And as you've noted, the department needs to take steps to, to increase internal oversight because we've got nearly $10 billion in OJP programs and active grants. So the first question I had today is, uh, something you mentioned in, in your, your testimony about a thorough pre-award risk analysis uh, that, that's done before any grant is awarded. And I imagine that the, the pre-award risk analysis goes directly to just the initial grant recipient, is that right? That's correct, Congressman. So is, is there any pre-award risk analysis of the sub-recipients of those grants? Because I know that's a common practice. Uh, Typically, there is not pre-award assessment of the subgrantees because it's not always clear who those would be. However, we do have several measures in place where uh, grantees, of course, as you pointed out, we do uh, assess the risk they may pose, and they're required. We give them quite a bit of training with regard to how to monitor. We have certain monitoring requirements from them during the course of uh, their grant um, project performance, and uh, then we do provide our own oversight depending on what we see on the ground through our program managers. So in, in your view, is, is all that working out pretty well? I mean, is that a sufficient buffer for abuses at the sub-recipient level, you think? Uh, sub-recipient um, grantees are a challenge. I think we have the structure in place, and a lot of times it's, it's a matter of working more closely with our grantees to properly monitor them. I think those efforts could be enhanced. I think we are continually um, learning from perhaps past problems and um, enhancing our efforts uh, to monitor those more closely. But again, it's, it's rarely uh, as a result of misbehavior. It's often just a lack of, 
appropriate knowledge or understanding, and really working with the grantees and to the extent necessary the sub-grantees to make sure they understand what's expected. Appreciate that. Does, um, does the Office of Justice Programs provide grants for overseas projects? I, I think I've, I've read where there's some of that um, is going overseas, and, and if so, is, there, is it possible for us to get a comprehensive list of all of those? We'll be, we'll be happy to get you a comprehensive list and follow up. I can tell you that it's, it's fairly rare. The only examples I'm aware of would be some grants in the Mexico and potentially in the Canada. Um, but I don't want to limit my answer to that. We'll follow up with you and get you a comprehensive list. I, I could be wrong. I, I think I read somewhere about uh, seminars or programs in Bulgaria and some maybe Western Europe. I, I, I'm a little hazy on it, but that's why I was asking for the summary. So that'd be helpful. Uh, absolutely. We'll be happy to provide that. So when, when those grants or those funds are being used overseas or sent to programs like that, is, how does DOJ ensure that grants are being carried out in accordance with our, our law and our values? I mean, is there any safeguards in place for that that you know of? Uh, yes, it would be the, the same safeguards that I would outlined previously. We, we closely monitor our grantees, we require them to monitor their sub-grantees. Um, we have program managers. We who oversee the programs. We also have our financial office that provides quite a bit of oversight. We also work very closely with the Office of Inspector General and uh, at times with the uh, GAO to monitor those. All right, so um, the department's conducting these routine reviews of the grant recipients' finances and progress. You're ensuring that the rigid parameters of every grant are continuously met. Let's say that you uncovered a discrepancy or and forbid some sort of intentional fraud or something. Does, at, at what point would the department require a grantee to pay back an award when, when waste or fraud or abuse is detected? That is a potential remedy. We always try to work with our grantees uh, so that money is not called back or recaptured. It happens on occasion. It begins first with, if we discover there's a problem, the first thing we'll do is consult with our grantee on how to correct those. Um, we will typically, or um, commonly go ahead and freeze the funds at that time uh, until we are satisfied that those corrections have been made. Um, it would be rare, but it has happened, even in my short time at OJP, where we've had to call back some funding. It, uh, I'm, I'm running out of time quickly here, but just as a follow-up to that, it, um, are there whistleblower provisions uh, that apply to all of this? So if, if someone's out in the field, so to speak, and they see waste or fraud or abuse and they report it. Um, is that part of the program? I mean, It is. Okay. Uh, whistleblower protections, uh, certainly within the department and within the office, yes. Got it. Um, well, I'm out of time, so um, I will uh, recognize the ranking member, Mr. Conyers, uh, for five minutes. Thank you very much, and thank you for your testimony. Uh, it's been uh, helpful to us. And we want to stay in contact as we uh, continue to work through uh, what we're drawing out of the hearings today. Uh, with reference to the community-oriented police services uh, and about police militarization, what is the uh, status of the interagency working group on lending federal military equipment? Um, as, as you mentioned, we have a permanent working group on law enforcement equipment. Um, in the past couple of years, it made some recommendations that were implemented under the prior administration. Uh, we have heard some level of concern from stakeholders in that regard, and we have recently reconvened that permanent working group to sort of reassess um, and look at sort of the parameters of what that equipment's desired to be used for and what equipment may be proper to supply to given law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. Now, does the interagency working group prescribe policies and practices for state and local law enforcement use of federally resourced military weapons and equipment? Uh, the working group does uh, set policies and parameters for the appropriate use. Yes, Congressman. Mm -hmm. And is it operating fairly well or? Okay, how would you describe uh, what's happening there? Um, I, I think we feel like it's working well. Um, however, like I said, there have been some uh, stakeholder concerns expressed in the past couple of years. And so that permanent working group continues to assess, uh, particularly in light of the new administration, uh, how best that law enforcement equipment can be supplied. Mm. 
Does the uh, interagency working group prohibit certain federally resourced military weapons uh, and equipment for use by state and local law enforcement, if you know? That's correct. There are certain limitations on the use of that equipment, yes. Mm -hmm. do, do, does, do any come to mind that you'd like us to know about? The only one I remember, uh, because I said it on the initial part of one meeting, was um, essentially a tracked armored vehicle, so essentially a, a tank. I know there's a, some limitations on that. Others I'd have to check and get back to you. Mm -hmm. Well, make the check, and if the, there is, please add it to the, our record. Be happy to do so. And uh, finally, what is the status of the implementation of the Death and Custody Reporting Act? Uh, DICRA was enacted uh, relatively recently, um, mm -hmm. and now we have, since the year 2000, been compiling death and custody uh, statistics uh, through the FBI and, and Bureau of Justice Statistics. However, uh, DICRA has changed the parameters uh, of how that information is collected, required to be collected from the states. Uh, we have been working on that since the enactment. Uh, the federal plan for doing so is, is still being developed, and then, of course, we'll have to work with our partners in the state to collect that information. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, uh, which office within the Office of Justice Programs is overseeing DECRA implementation? Yes, that has been uh, part of the ongoing planning for compliance with DICRA. However, currently, uh, plans are pointing to the Bureau of Justice Assistance for doing so. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, uh, uh, how's DECRA implementation being coordinated with other Department of Justice data collection efforts around police community encounters, including the FBI use of force database and the community-oriented policing services, uh, which was formerly in the White House uh, Police Data Initiative. Uh, as we continue to compile um, and uh set forth our efforts in collecting that data. I do know that we are leveraging all the statistical resources within the department. So FBI, Bureau of Justice Statistics uh, do that now, and, and the Bureau of Justice Assistance is, as of now, expected to head up that effort. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Chairman, Judge, I yield back. Thank you. Still hard not to call you, Mr. Chairman, and we're for so long, but uh, exactly. thank you. At this time, we'll recognize uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Chabot, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here, Mr. Hanson. Just a few questions. First of all, um, we obviously see far too many officers killed um, across the country in the line of duty every year. What steps is the department taking to prioritize uh, the safety of our law enforcement officers all across the country? Well, in addition to the executive order uh, that the president issued very early in his, uh, his term uh, calling for our efforts to protect law enforcement, um, we have, I think those priorities are reflected in the budget request for FY 2018. As I also mentioned, we have an upcoming, uh, we've, the Attorney General has created a task force on crime reduction, uh, and within that task force there's a subcommittee specifically uh, devoted to, as we call it, back the blue, and that is particularly to protecting and promoting the safety and wellness of law enforcement officers. Uh, within the, the numerous uh, programs that, that we have within uh, OJP and COPS and, uh, and OVW to a lesser extent, to protect uh, the police, uh, one in particular I'll highlight is the Valor Initiative, and that's a, a five-part um, program looking at a, a variety of areas that we can assist law enforcement officers uh, providing officer safety and wellness training, uh, active shooter response and training, de-escalation training and technical assistance, um, officer safety and wellness programs uh, to hopefully uh, drive police uh, fatalities to zero, and also a, a research and evaluation program. Thank you. Um, as a longtime member of this committee, 20 plus years now, I, I, uh, I want to commend the president on the uh, emphasis that he's putting on keeping our uh, brave men and women in uniform across the country uh, 
to be as safe as possible. It's a very dangerous job. Uh, we've had far too many killed over the years. I've been to far too many of the candlelight uh, ceremonies here in, in Washington and also too many funerals back in my district in the city of Cincinnati over the years too. So I want to commend him for that and urge him to keep up the, uh, his attention on this issue. Um, let me move on to a couple other things real quickly. Um, during the last hearing, I asked, I had asked about the body-worn cameras uh, and the pros and cons associated with officers wearing such devices. What are the eligible uses uh, for grant awards in support of uh, body-worn cameras? Uh, within our body-worn camera program, uh, that could also be funded through, I believe, the Burn Justice Assistance Grants program as well. Uh, we provide for, uh, obviously, um, acquisition of equipment, so actual body cameras, as well as um, policies and procedures for their use, implementation, uh, and technology associated with that. Okay, thank you. Um, when I first came here, again, a long time ago, President Clinton was uh, in, in office, and he had pushed uh, the COPS program, which a number of Republicans, uh, including myself, had taken a look at in general support, it, although we had some concerns. One, one of the concerns that, that we had was that it put some cities in the position where they would hire folks for a couple of years with federal dollars, and then unfortunately the dollars went away after a couple of years, and the cities couldn't necessarily afford to keep them on. People got laid off. Would, would you want to comment on that, and have we done anything to adjust that, to, to address that issue? Uh, I believe so. I mean, as, as I'm sure you know, the program is designed such that we do provide federal resources for the first few years with the understanding and requirement that the local jurisdiction maintains, doesn't simply lay off. Um, obviously, there are challenges fiscally and otherwise in local jurisdictions, and I, I wouldn't be able to speak authoritatively, but I do, do know we try to work with uh, local jurisdictions to ensure they're complying with the requirements of the program. Thank you. The President has been uh, outspoken um, on making sure that our local communities are complying uh, with federal law with respect to enforcing our immigration laws, and it's been a uh, fairly controversial topic in some cities and states across the, the country. Would you want to uh, comment on uh, if communities declare themselves sanctuary cities, what impact that might have on, on federal funding? Yes, uh, particularly within the Department of Justice. Um, so simply declaring that they are a sanctuary jurisdiction in and of itself might trigger suspicion, but it wouldn't immediately trigger action on our part. Um, in accordance with the Attorney General's uh, grant funding memo of May 22nd, we're looking particularly at three grant programs administered through the Department of Justice. That's the COPS program, the Burn JAG program, as well as SCAP payments, particularly where we're going to require uh, jurisdictions to certify that they are in compliance with 8 U.S.C. 1373 as a condition of receiving any grant funding under those programs. Great. Thank you. And as my time is wrapping up, let me just comment on one final thing. Uh, the opioid addiction and deaths as a result of that has just been a tragedy all across the country, including my state in Cincinnati. And I saw a figure the other day that said that uh, back in 1980, I think there were about 10,000 deaths nationwide due to overdose on, on drugs. And that's gone from 10,000 to almost 60,000 last year. Uh, would you want to comment? And I, Mr. Chairman, if you'll give me an additional 30 seconds, I would greatly appreciate it. Without objection. Thank you very much. Uh, that is a priority of this administration, this Attorney General. Uh, under the Comprehensive Addiction uh, and Recovery Act, we have uh, created the um, Combating Opioid Addiction Program. Uh, significant resources are being devoted in FY17 and requests for FY18, in addition to other existing resources uh, of well over, a total of over $100 million devoted particularly to addressing that crisis and hopefully uh, creating uh, an environment where folks either choose not to become addicted to opioids or assist them in becoming free of that scourge. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from New York, Mr. Jeffries is recognized for five minutes. I thank the uh, distinguished chair as well as uh, the witness for your presence and uh, your testimony here today. I want to pick up where my distinguished colleague from the great state of Ohio left off on the Sanctuary Cities uh, conversation. Um, Mr. Hansen, I assume you're familiar with President Trump's executive order entitled Enhancing Public Safety in the Interior of the United States? I am. And Section 9A uh, orders the Attorney General and the Secretary to ensure that jurisdictions that willfully refuse to comply with 8 U.S.C. 1373 
so-called sanctuary jurisdictions are not eligible to receive federal grants, is that right? That's, yes, that's correct. Now, in the previous fiscal year, New York City, so-called sanctuary jurisdiction, received $4.3 in burn justice assistance grant funding that it could lose under this order, is that right? That's correct. Good. Uh, and on Friday the 21st, as I believe you just testified, the Department of Justice sent a letter to New York City and maybe other cities asking uh, New York City to demonstrate its compliance with Section 1373, is that right? That's right. That was uh, April 21. That was a, a reminder letter of, of the requirement to do so, yes. Okay, but are you aware that federal courts have found that policies that limit or prohibit compliance with immigration holds and requests for notice of relief do not violate Section 1373? <clears throat> um, I'm aware of ongoing litigation surrounding the sanctuary cities issue. I'm not sure if I understand that particular limitation you've described. Okay, well, let's go through some of the uh, jurisprudence that exists. Uh, according to the United States District Court, Northern District of California, uh, in the Steinle versus City and County of San Francisco case, Section 1373 only prohibits the enactment of certain policies about sharing immigration status information. It does not command the states or cities to administer or enforce federal law. Was that the holding of that decision? Um, I'll be honest, I did not read the entire decision, but that is my understanding of it, yes. Okay, and then the Third Circuit, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, I believe the Virgin Islands, uh, in the Galarza decision, uh, I believe held, immigration detainers do not and cannot compel a state or local law enforcement agency to detain suspected undocumented individuals subject to removal and courts holding Electing not to respond to them is entirely within the discretion of local law enforcement. Is that your understanding of the Third Circuit's decision? Is, again, I have not read that opinion, but that's my understanding. Okay, now, are you familiar with the Supreme Court's case in Arizona versus the United States? Um, if you mean from a few years back, I am. That's correct. Uh, and that decision held nothing in federal law requires localities to enforce immigration laws and regulations, correct? Yes, that's my understanding. And I assume you're familiar with the Tenth Amendment? Also, yes. Okay. And the Tenth Amendment precludes federal government, the federal government, from coercing state or local governments to use their resources to enforce federal laws or regulations like immigration. Is that correct? Um, that is um, certainly a, a fair interpretation of that, yes. And that's a concept known as the anti-commandeering document, correct? Doctrine, correct? Yes. Uh, and the Supreme Court has continuously upheld the anti-commandeering doctrine, correct? I believe that's correct, yes. In fact, Justice Scalia, may rest in peace, uh, who was obviously uh, a conservative, I'm a progressive, but had great respect for his legal mind, uh, when he struck down in Prince versus United States key provisions of the Brady Bill, stated, it is an essential attribute of the state's retained sovereignty that they remain independent and autonomous within their proper sphere, and that they should not be, his words, dragooned, very creative, dragooned into administering federal law. Are you familiar with that decision? Yes, yes. Chief Justice Roberts, again, conservative, I'm a progressive Democrat, Supreme Court decision uh, in NFIB versus Sebelius, which struck down a few provisions of the Affordable Care Act, uh, noted that if you forbid funding conditions that are so coercive, they amount to a gun to the head of the state or local government, and that is inconsistent with federal law or the Constitution, correct? Yes, that was, I recall that ruling. And so I guess, in closing, my time has expired. I can't understand why the Department of Justice, which is the entity that should administer the law, faithfully execute, as well as the Constitution, can conduct themselves in this fashion, notwithstanding clear judicial precedent from the Article III branch of government to the contrary, including decisions written by some of the greatest conservative legal scholars ever to exist in this great republic. And I would hope not that you would listen to the voices of those of us on this side of the aisle,
but listen to those who have consistently articulated decisions anchored in the valued precedent of federalism in this great country. I yield back. Thank the gentleman, and especially the uh, shout out to federalism. <laughs> At this time, I uh, recognize the gentlelady from Alabama, Ms. Roby. Thank Five you very minutes. much. Hello, Mr. Hanson. Hello, Congresswoman. Pleasure. Good to see you here. My Congratulations pleasure. on your new position. Thank you. Uh, as a tac acting assistant attorney general uh, for the Office of Justice Program. So thank you for being here today. Um, two things I wanted to talk about, um, uh, missing and exploited children uh, programs. Uh, Congress has provided an average of 70 million a year for the past three years uh, for these programs. And wanted to just hear from you uh, maybe a breakdown of how uh, the Department of Justice um, intends or has allocated this funding. Uh, this is something very important to me. When I joined this committee and this Congress, uh, I wanted and, and made it clear that I wanted to focus a lot of my energy and attention uh, to missing and exploited children's programs as well as human and sex trafficking uh, issues across the board. We've recently passed the um, Global Child Protection Act and some other really important pieces of legislation that we've worked directly with DOJ on uh, so that we can continue uh, to advocate and fight for uh, the victims of these horrific crimes. And so if you could just talk a little bit about that funding um, and uh, any um, anything you want to add as it relates to uh, funding in the FY18 as well. Sure. Well, thank you for that question. Um, exploitation of children is a very serious issue for all of us and certainly for our Attorney General. Uh, the department, as you pointed out, has committed significant resources over the years, and that commitment continues in our FY18 budget request. Um, and uh, a large portion of that funding will go to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children for a variety of programs that it runs um, to both help children that have been exploited or, or abducted in some way, and also to prevent that. We have a number of other programs looking at internet crimes against children, um, and uh, other grant programs, so very significant funding to help not only hopefully prevent those crimes, but then also assist them if they are victims of them. Um, we'd be happy to get you, I don't have it with me, but a, a comprehensive breakdown of that spending, we'd be happy to get it to you. Well, I, I would appreciate that, and please know that you have very willing partners here. Um, these are horrible abuses uh, that are taking place. Um, not just uh, globally, but right in our own backyard. And I know you're aware, but even in our state of Alabama, um, we've recently, um, has been brought to our attention about the corridor between Birmingham and Atlanta uh, and what's going on right there. And I think the more we talk about it, as hard as it is to talk about these terrible things that are being done to children, um, uh, the, we need to make sure that we are doing our part to educate others about what is going on right here in our own country as well. So please uh, know that I look forward to continuing to work with the department on these issues and looking for opportunities uh, to combat these horrible crimes. I want to go back to uh, what uh, the gentleman from Ohio was talking about with opiate abuse. Uh, this too is um, our um, has become an epidemic. It is an epidemic in our country. Um, the more I read and learn about what's going on, um, we, we have to continue to do all that we can as members of Congress to make sure that the resources are available. Um, we did so, as you mentioned, with the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act, CARA. Um, but I, I just wanted to know the conversations that you're having uh, in the department with stakeholders, who those stakeholders might be, and then also the issue of pilfering. Uh, there was um, uh, some grants that were to be made available to deal with this issue uh, on the um, uh, locking mechanism of the, the pills that may be in a cabinet where a child uh, or, or anyone could, would have access to. Um, so if you could just maybe expand a little bit on that issue, that would be great. Sure. No, um, so as, as I mentioned uh, to Congressman Chabot, the um, Combating Opioid uh, Addiction Program devotes, we're proposing uh, in FY18, $20 million or so, to vote particularly to a number of grants looking to help local communities um, to develop uh, 
systems, processes, ways of assisting um, uh, addicts, as well as, of course, a number of other resources with drug courts, intervention, counseling, that can be leveraged for that purpose as well. Uh, you talked about, the, I think, the Secure Pill Bottle program. That is something that could be funded. We don't have a solicitation specific to that, but that is something that could be funded through one of our co-op grants. And I expect we would see some uh, proposals to that effect, and we'll certainly give them very serious consideration. Sure, and I appreciate that as well. And I mean, it's, of course, that's just one example amongst many that um, that these very precious dollars could be used to help combat again this epidemic, this very serious epidemic in our country. Thank you again for your service. Glad to see you here today, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I will go ahead and um, recognize myself for five minutes um, and try not to duplicate anything else because uh, one of the things we're hoping that is going to be done by the DOJ is cut out a lot of the duplication that has uh, occurred over the years. And I'm probably more than most recognize the difficulties this DOJ will have because of what has gone on before us. I've been down on the uh, Texas-Mexico uh, border all hours, many nights, and our Border Patrol open up and talk a bit in the middle of the night. And what I've seen over and over in talking to them is, um, as, as uh, was shared one night, I uh, was asked, do you know what the drug cartels call Homeland Security? Know what? Uh, they call us logistics, like the commercial. The drug cartels say, all we have to do is get our future employees across the border, and then Homeland Security ships them wherever we want them to go. I've been there numerous times when, as the officers go through their questions, they add a question that many of them want to know, how much did you pay the gangs, the drug cartels, to get here? And it was often five, six, seven thousand, eight thousand. You don't have that money. Where'd you come up with that money? And this was usually in Spanish, and I'd have somebody helping me. <clears throat> But the response would be, oh, we got 1,500, 2,000 from friends in America, 1,000 here, 1,000. Well, what are you doing for the rest of it? They're going to let us let me work it off when I get to the city where I'm going. They had employees paying the drug cartels to let them be employees for free in cities all over America. So while we're spending millions of dollars through DOJ trying to help local law enforcement. At the same time, we were using Homeland Security money to ship future criminal agents, and some of them in desperate situations, whether it's sex trafficking or drugs. So it seems like some of the money DOJ is now going to be spending is going to be having to de help communities deal with what we did to them in recent years. Um, so let me ask you, um, can you tell a little more about the National Summit on Crime Reduction and Public Safety? How is that going to help these situations? Well, um, the upcoming summit, which is uh, being uh, conducted in the auspices of the National uh, Crime Reduction Task Force, created by the Attorney General, is going to bring together a large group of stakeholders, community groups, crime groups, law enforcement, uh, prosecutors from throughout the country. And the idea is to bring them together and talk about different strategies and, and things they're doing to combat crime in the area and hopefully sort of um, share best practice with each other so that each jurisdiction and different group can learn from the other and can combine their knowledge and hopefully create strategies that we can uh, disseminate nationally to fight crime, including the, the sorts of problems that, that you've described. And have you worked personally directly with any law enforcement uh, in states and local governments? Um, I've had occasion to interact with a number of them. Uh, I've not, I've only, of course, I've only been on board about four and a half months, uh, but I've right. had the opportunity to talk to many law enforcement officers 
Uh, and I can tell you that what we're hearing is uh, across the board is just the breath of fresh air they feel coming from this attorney general and this administration about getting tough on crime in their jurisdictions and things that they're dealing with. Yeah. And hopefully not shipping any more people to their locales that they're going to end up having to deal with. Uh, I can tell um, you that you've got an attorney general that is absolutely committed to ending illegality at the border and stopping those people there, prosecuting them there, and then sending them back. And I hope you know you don't have to tell me. Uh, I consider Jeff Sessions to be a dear friend and just a, a wonderful person. Um, well, one of the, the things that it, Mr. Jeffries expressed as a concern, and it's certainly a concern of mine, I know it was a concern of Senator Jeff Sessions, and I'm sure yourself, um, we do, we send out money, and often over the years it's been so we could put strings on it and dictate local control. Now, I know Attorney General, I was so pleased that he ended some of the consent decrees, which appeared to me to be a takeover of lo local law enforcement by the feds, uh, or as Mark Levin says, federalizing local law enforcement. Uh, can you tell us any more about that working relationship with communities that have perhaps had problems, consent decree has been removed, are we working with them to help them with money to uh, get their systems up and working appropriately as law enforcement? We are. Um, it, is, it is our job, at the, particularly in the grant making uh, components of the department, to get this money to law enforcement officers and agencies so they can use it to reduce crime, promote public safety, and of course uh, protect the well-being and safety of their officers. Um, we always work with jurisdictions to make sure they're in compliance with whatever grant conditions may exist. It is not our job to deny them funding. It's to make sure that they fulfill the requirements to receive it. Okay. Well, my time has expired. Um, going to see, uh, did the um, uh, gentleman from Louisiana or the gentlelady from Alabama have any further questions? All right. Uh, then, Mr. Hanson, we don't always get an opportunity to do this, but you're the sole witness today, and you've had great questions from both sides of the aisle. Um, sometimes you don't completely respond or think of other things that you might wish to say, maybe to uh, expand on comments that were already made. Uh, what would you say is the most important takeaway that this committee should have from this hearing today? Uh, I just want you to know that we're here to work with you, our authorizers and Congress, um, to combat crime, um, to promote public safety and protect our law enforcement officers. Um, and um, as you pointed, as has been pointed out in a number of the statements today, um, sometimes there's duplication in programs, some different programs that come outdated and need for flexibility. We're here to work with you and to get your thoughts on the best way forward to, again, pursue those policy priority areas set out by the AG and the President. Um, and I would, I would also say that there's, there's no need or concern about commandeering local uh, law enforcement officers. We're here to work with them as a partner and not to, to direct them or tell them what to do. And, um, anything further from prior answers that you wish to expand on or you thought of since that you wanted to add? Well, uh, I'll just add just a little bit, uh, just uh, to my exchange with Congressman Jeffries. Um, the way forward on the Sanctuary City grant funding um, determination, in accordance with the Attorney General's memo from May 22nd, is just to look at three grant programs that were actually identified last year uh, with regard to 1373 compliance. All jurisdictions were placed on notice in FY16 and agreed that compliance with 8 uh, USC 1373 would be a condition of receiving that grant. And so we are simply carrying that policy forward. There's no attempt to commandeer or otherwise deny grant funding, except that as a grant condition, uh, jurisdictions must comply with all applicable federal laws and are on notice that 8 U.S.C. 1373 is one of those applicable laws. Thank you. Uh, of course, one of the concerns that uh, is expressed in local jurisdictions, yeah, we award this grant money and, and people hear the total amount, uh, whether it's you know, 70 million, whatever it happens to be for a particular program. And yet, normally it's not pointed out that salaries 
usually come out of that amount at DOJ to implement the money that goes to the local jurisdictions. And um, in a different committee yesterday, um, we were hearing from uh, part of the Department of Interior that they were running about 25% as uh, administrative costs. And as I pointed out to them, if they were in the private sector, uh, they'd be fired and never be allowed to touch that money again. But uh, being in this, they're in the government, 25% uh, may be deemed not that unreasonable. I think it is. But um, what do you see the Department of Justice doing to minimize the amount of money necessary to pay for salaries and administrative costs at DOJ so that more can go to the locales that actually need it? Uh, <clears throat> it is a priority of ours to concentrate the resources Congre make, Congress makes available to us to the law enforcement, state and local law enforcement agencies who are our partners. Uh, as such, we try to minimize the overhead uh, for lack of a better term, uh, that's taken out of those. We do not receive at OJP any direct appropriation for management or administration. Therefore, uh, we do have to take the funding, salaries, and, and other costs out of the grants. However, we consistently keep that below 8%. And I believe we propose for FY18 about 7.7 .7 that's drawn across the board from most, but not all of the grant programs. So not even all of the programs we administer uh, do we take that 7.7% drawdown from that. Um. Um, our hearing is basically coming to a conclusion, but uh, I want to take a point of personal privilege uh, and point out, I don't know of anybody else in our committee during the years that uh, President Bush was in office and his, the person he chose as director of the FBI, Robert Mueller was FBI director, but had numerous exchanges with Director Mueller. He had his five-year up or out program. For most people that have dealt with federal law enforcement, they know um, from a local standpoint that it normally takes five years for a state and local law enforcement group to feel comfortable with a federal agent as they come in or they come in and they're in a, a special agent in charge supervisor position. Often the feeling is, okay, is this going to be one of those guys that takes all our work and runs and does a press conference, or are they going to actually be a partner? Five years, you know what you got. You know you got partners. And we had incredible, experienced FBI agents all over the country doing phenomenal work. And his five-year up or out program, when you're a supervisor five years, you either got to get out or come to Washington. And so many of them thought, I'm not coming to Washington and being a yes man. A minion, I am, I'd rather stay here, I can make more money, I wish I could stay in the FBI and continue to work even though a lesser salary. And as I think the Wall Street Journal pointed out, we lost thousands and thousands of years of experience in the FBI. Uh, as, as I felt like Director Mueller basically gutted the FBI of so much experience. And if you're looking for a bunch of yes men, then the less experienced, the better. But I would just encourage you and uh, our attorney general, you know, use those assets. Uh, let's build it back from what uh, Director Mueller uh, brought it down to. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, and I'm grateful for the people that are still there with the experience but it's gonna make your job harder. So appreciate your being here today. Um, no, it's not fun testifying except for the bonus check you get for coming. To, <laughs> yeah. And not everybody in government appreciates sarcasm, but the witness is not receiving any remuneration for testifying. But without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witness our additional materials for the record. Uh, if there's nothing further, hearing nothing further, our hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Carson.